construction uh, with this project is that um, this last spring um, in the United States, an unprecedented wave of protests broke out um, in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, against police brutality. We have had over the past several years, a series of police killings um, that have really generated a lot of uh, anger and frustration and resulted in really widespread protests. One prominent criticism of policing in the United States that's arisen during these protests, that these protests are really highlighting, is that police forces in recent years have become more militarized, adopting the weaponry, tactics, and organizational structures of the military. So you, uh, you can see here uh, an image from the recent protests in Portland, Oregon. There's pro protests all over the United States. Um, but in major cities, we had highly militarized police units that were sent in to address the protests. So this is an image from Portland, Oregon, where federal police officers are standing guard after uh, trying to corral uh, protesters. You can see here that the police officers are in military uh, fatigues. Uh, they're in camouflage. They have military grade weapons weaponry and they have um, masks for, for tear gas. So they're, uh, they're, they're pretty heavily, they look, they look like military officers and not the sort of local uh, community, uh, community police. And so there's a lot of attention and interest to, in the United States, to how we got here. Um, why is it that police forces in the United States have become so militarized and how did that happen? But one thing that I knew from my research on security forces around the globe was that this is not just a, an American phenomenon. In fact, police forces around the globe have become more militarized in recent years. And there's been protest uh, about that in many other countries as well. The next image um, I'm showing here is from recent protests in Nigeria. Uh, there's been a movement that started in 2017 uh, and has continued to today, um, protesting police brutality and repression in Nigeria. And specifically, it's mobilized around protest against a special police unit called SARS. Um, there's, you might have seen the hashtag NSARS. You can see in the, uh, in several of the signs here, police reform, disband SARS, um, end SARS, enemy of the state. Uh, this is the special anti-robbery squad that was established um, within uh, the Nigerian police, uh, police force, and they have been um, tied to a sort of series of abuses. And so it's not just a situation that's, that's happening in the United States. Um, despite the uh, widespread nature of militarized policing, there's not a ton that we know about it. Um, what we do know is that in some contexts, um, most of this research has happened uh, only looking at the US case, militarized policing is associated with higher rates of police violence. So in the United States, a whole series of local police departments um, get, got access to military grade weaponry. It's all the surplus supplies from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that were made available to local police departments. Um, and those local police departments that got more of these weapons uh, ended up um, having then higher rates of police violence in subsequent years. And so we know that there's a sort of that association. Research on the US case also suggests that militarized policing can help reinforce racial hierarchies. So militarized police units are more likely to target black communities in the United States, that it can undermine police community relations and harm the reputation of the police all while not actually helping uh, reduce crime. However, uh, there's very little work um, that at least within sort of uh, political science research uh, that's happening um, uh, on policing outside of the United States or militarized policing in particular. There's one recent article um, that is undertaken by two researchers at Cornell University uh, that focuses on Latin America and tries to understand the increasing use of the military for policing. So not um, they look at militarized police uh, forces, but then their main focus is on when states actually bring the military in to do the policing. And they find that this very heavily a militarized form of policing, policing actually by the military, is associated with all sorts of negative consequences. Um, yeah, they have a the whole series of um, uh, different things that they're looking at there. But there's a lot we still don't know about militarized policing, about its causes and its consequences. Um, there's recent research that suggested that uh, the documents what I found anecdotally, which is that most of this stuff is really focused on the US. I believe you had uh, Charles Crabtree here as an earlier speaker in this series. Um, he uh, did a study a couple years ago that was surveying all of the work that was done on policing in political science and found that more than 50% is focused on the US. 
This work also doesn't uh, try to document broader patterns in part because uh, internationally, in part because just there isn't data on police forces globally yet. Um, so this has left open a series of, I think, kind of big questions uh, that are the questions I'm trying to tackle in, in my new research project. So first, just how and why did militarized policing spread internationally? Um, this is, a, there are some who would argue that police forces are always militarized to some extent, which I think is true. Um, but you, we really have seen an uptick in recent decades, particularly in the use of these special tactical units and riot squads. And there's new access to military gear that a lot of police forces are getting that they didn't have previously. Even if they were previously repressive um, in various ways, they now have new equipment with which um, to, to carry out that repression. So how and why did militarized policing spread? Um, and then a sort of second big question here, what we don't know yet, is, is it an effective way for states and regimes to combat internal security threats? The reason that states are militarizing their police forces is because they're um, typically because they are facing uh, internal security threats in the form of terrorism or insurgency or just protests against the regime. And uh, my suspicion in beginning this project was that this was actually gonna be counterproductive for them, that militarizing police units would not actually help with political stability or regime survival or uh, things of that nature. But that's what I'm, um, I'm setting out to investigate in this project. So what I'm gonna uh, walk you through in the rest of the presentation today is what existing data is out there on uh, militarized policing, what we can learn from it, what the limitations are. I'm gonna tell you about my new data collection efforts, um, which is in progress. And then I'm gonna give you some preliminary findings um, about what's happening in police forces in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. So that's the region of the globe that I've uh, actually completed <laughs> the data collection for. Um, and I'll show you some preliminary results there about why I think it spread um, and what the political consequences have been. So existing data, um, I'm largely drawing from my own earlier data collection uh, projects, which you may be familiar with, um, or may not. Uh, it's this uh, data set of state security forces across the globe. It uh, includes, at this point, 375 security forces in 110 countries that were selected uh, randomly. Um, I only did 110 countries because it is very, it took a very long time to collect those data and I'm just one person. Um, and so I was trying to take a random sample uh, so that I could actually get enough, <laughs> get enough cases in here that, that I could, um, that it would be useful. Um, and I didn't want to just focus on one region. And so this data goes from 1960 to 2010, um, and to the 2010 end date was just because that's when I actually started collecting this data in 2010. Uh, it was not published until earlier this year, so it was a decade-long uh, data collection effort. Um, and uh, yeah, it took a very long time doing this on my own. So um, what I did in this data set was um, include all security forces that I found that were organized at the, the state level, the federal level, so not um, police forces that are just for individual states uh, within a country or um, not local police forces or uh, things like that, but only ones organized at the federal level. Um, and I tried to exclude the regular military. So those forces that were tasked with external defense, primarily the Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, um, those, are not, those are not in there. And it includes police forces. So I did include some police forces in this, in this data set where I found that they had two or more indicators of militarization. And I took this from a literature review of militarized policing in criminology, sociology, and political science um, from Ron Tatalo in 2012. And he identified four potential indicators of that a police force was militarized. Command and control centers, elite squads patterned after military special operations, barrack housing, and long range deployment capabilities. These are very difficult to find information on systematically for police forces across the globe. Uh, and so basically, if I saw evidence of two of them, I just moved on. And I didn't track very well what, um, you know, I didn't have a specific threshold for what long range deployment capabilities meant um, or what percentage of the force had to be in barrack housing or anything like that. I just, any reference to they're in barracks or they could be deployed uh, across, you know, multiple, like from one city to another. I consider that long range. So it's kind of a rough uh, coding. 
Um, but it's the one advantage of this data set is that it really, because it was a decade long <laughs> project, um, I really spent a lot of time going into uh, trying, like basically trying to triangulate from a whole bunch of different sources. So um, I looked at national defense legislation, government websites, historical dictionaries, annual defense reviews, and geo reports, just like a whole list of sources that I used for every country that's in the data set. And I really tried to be very comprehensive and get an understanding from um, experts on that specific country about what are the sort of main security forces. And so in some ways I do think it's pretty comprehensive of, for the security forces in each country. That said, there are um, some limitations that I'll talk about in a minute. But if we just take this data, so this was the existing data uh, that we had that might talk about militarized policing. Um, and when um, I started to think about this last spring, I said, let me see what, what trends are in this data. What, do, what can this data tell us? And what I found was that most countries, uh, at least as of 2010, use some form of militarized policing. Um, more than 75% of them in, two, uh, in 2010 uh, used um, riot squads or sort of paramilitary gendarmerie style forces. They used some form of policing that looks more like the military, um, that had at least two of those indicators uh, that I mentioned. Um, and this includes 60% of countries that were um, coded as democratic by polity um, and other indicators of, of democracy. So some 60% of democracies do this as well. I also do see a trend over time in increasing use of militarized, uh, militarized police forces. Um, because I was particularly interested in what was happening in the U.S., uh, putting the U.S. in context, um, I also noted, uh, looking at this data, that the United States really seemed to be an outlier in how fragmented and decentralized the policing system was. So most countries do not have local police forces and state-level police forces and federal police forces with like, you know, 40 different overlapping agencies. Um, the United States is, is pretty unique. Uh, India is also a country with a lot of internal security forces, um, several different police forces, um, but it's not as, uh, as decentralized even as the United States. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty much an outlier. Um, the United States is also unique among uh, what we think of as uh, wealthier democracies in establishing a new federal police force that's militarized in recent years. Most countries, if they were establishing um, a sort of new large scale force um, have in recent years have not been democracies. Um, but the United States did this in 2003 uh, it, with the creation of ICE. This is Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And I debated for a while if this should be like considered a police force or <laughs> considered a border guard force. And we could sort of talk about uh, what the distinctions might be there and how, how to tell. Um, but ICE has jurisdiction um, uh, through much of the United States. And so they're not confined to trying to prevent people from crossing the border. They actually do raids in cities across the country and in rural areas. And so they have that kind of nationwide jurisdiction. So I include them in this, uh, in this data. However, there's some real limitations. Uh, I collected this data for a different purpose um, than tracking militarized policing. Um, there's some limitations with the data in general, which is just that I found uh, that there is more information available in, in English in, for countries of US strategic interest. So there is a lot of information on some countries and less on others. Um, and there's also increased attention to the different countries um, outside the United States uh, after the Cold War. So during the Cold War, the United States is supporting a lot of really repressive regimes globally and funneling resources to uh, dictatorships without paying a lot of attention to what they're doing with their internal security forces. This becomes um, kind of concern about what internal security forces are doing becomes a much bigger deal after the end of the Cold War for the United States. And so they start to be more uh, reporting um, uh, that's happening uh, after that time. So so there's just those are kind of structural features of the data that I can't or potential you know biases in the data that uh, are, are going to be present due to the types of source material that I that I was depending on. Most relevant for trying to understand patterns in militarized policing though is this issue that how I categorized police forces um, or security forces in this data set was not a uh, done with the goal of identifying and tracking trends in militarized policing. I, as the code book for this data set uh, will tell you, uh, I categorized security forces as presidential guards, militias, mil um, militarized police, interior troops, and border guards. 
uh, largely on the basis of their titles. So if they have police in the name, I counted them as a police force. If they have troops in the name, I was like, that's interior troops. <laughs> um, and then there's a bunch of other forces that it might be more ambiguous. And I mainly tried to kind of get a sense of like, is this under the defense department? Like, does this look a little bit more military like troops or does this look a little bit, is this, is this the force that's responsible for policing? Um, it was a really rough categorization. And to be honest, I added it because a reviewer asked for it when I was in this manuscript introducing the data set was under review. Um, and I didn't, I wasn't confident that I was accurately classifying all of the forces um, that would be militarized police forces. It's not clear in particular if some of these interior troops should be counted as police forces or these, these sort of um, forces that are described as paramilitary. Um, some of them are units of the regular military and so they shouldn't count and some of them are um, uh, responsible for sort of domestic uh, policing and law and order. And so I felt like I needed to sort of go back to this data. Um, there's also a limited range, as I said, I stopped in 2010 and I started in, uh, with 1960, which is not, uh, is not ideal. So what I'm doing uh, now, the project in progress, um, I don't know why I'm like punishing myself in this way and making myself collect more data, but um, it, uh, I'm trying to do a much more focused data collection effort that's specifically about militarized policing. And in order to do that, I felt like I needed to have a better conceptualization of militarized policing and a better set of, of indicators of what I would count and not count, not just, well, two or more of these things that this one lit review mentioned. Um, so I uh, decided to build off of a recent conceptualization of militarized policing um, that was put together by uh, Jess Zirkin and Gustavo Flores Macias at Cornell. They're the ones who did this study on Latin America. Um, and I've tweaked their uh, typology in a little bit of a way, and I think I have different coding rules from them. Um, but I did keep this sort of uh, distinction that they make between um, civilian police and then two forms of militarized policing. And I make this distinction uh, on the basis of the accountability of the force, like who do they report to, the weaponry, what they have access to, and their organization. So are they organized in a more decentralized or a more hierarchical manner? And civilian forces are the least militarized. Um, these would include many local police forces in the United States, many criminal investigation divisions of police forces elsewhere. Um, these are forces that are under an interior or a home ministry. They don't have access to military grade weaponry like infantry support um, weapons or armored vehicles or uh, aircraft or anything like that. Um, and they're organized in a very decentralized manner. You know, people in these forces don't deploy in large uh, formations. They, um, they're, uh, they often are in much smaller groups or in pairs. Uh, so they're not, um, they, they're not organized in a, in a more um, hierarchical way. Um, paramilitary forces at the other extreme here, um, some of them are under the defense ministry or under military control directly. They all have access to much higher grade military grade weaponry um, and they deploy in, um, uh, they use military deployment tactics. And they have a much more sort of hierarchical structure to them. Militarized civilian policing, this kind of category in the middle, um, is what I've used where uh, there's special units that have the features of these paramilitary forces, but not the whole force, right? And so in the US context, there are SWAT teams in many police forces that actually, um, uh, that have access to this military grade weaponry and they're, they deploy in um, these uh, sort of tight formations, uh, but they're embedded within a larger civilian police force. Um, in Fiji, there's a tactical response unit within the national police and in um, Tunisia, there's a, a, a public order brigade that um, sort of fits this special units um, uh, description, right? So the basic difference um, that I make, a distinction I'm making between militarized civilian police and paramilitary police is like, whether or not the weaponry and organization uh, is something that only special units have or the whole force has. Where uh, police forces are under the um, defense ministry or under the military directly, I also categorize them as paramilitary. Okay, so I do this kind of new typology and then I have to collect data uh, actually about the accountability, weaponry, and organization of police forces. So I'm doing that now. I'm taking a broader time frame from 1946 um, to the end of World War II to 2020. Um, and I'm collecting this information to try and categorize police forces as civilian, militarized civilian, and paramilitary. Thus far, data collection is complete for um, 
almost complete for the Middle East and North Africa or the MENA region. Um, and for this section, I worked with uh, someone fluent in Arabic and who's a specialist on the Middle East, Zach Karabartak, who's a uh, just received his PhD from Georgetown University. So it's been a really productive collaboration. Um, and I've really been able to benefit from him being able to read uh, newspaper articles and uh, legislation and government websites and stuff in Arabic rather than me relying on Google Translate, which is not the best. Um, so uh, we drew, we developed a preliminary list of police forces um, that we would search for information on from my data set, the state security forces data set, and then several other handbooks and encyclopedias about police and paramilitary forces around the globe. Um, these are from the 80s and, and, and the 2000s. And these gave us a kind of preliminary list that we then searched for information on and we would poke around on the you know, Ministry of Interior websites, home affairs websites um, of all of these individual countries. We also looked at uh, newspaper coverage um, because uh, in some places there was not a lot of information available that was like officially provided by the government, but there might be um, newspaper coverage of we're noting that police um, that were deployed to a protest were bringing uh, armored vehicles that they had, um, machine guns that they had, um, uh, assault rifles, things like that, so that we would be able to code it from newspaper, um, newspaper articles as well. So this is an overview, uh, sort of broad overview of what we found so far. Um, we looked at 19 countries in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, we excluded the UAE because they don't have a federal police structure, um, but we included other countries. Everything I will the only thing a weird thing I will note here is that um, Yemen we've only included since reunification in 1990 so it doesn't go back we need to go back and, and fill that in but everything else here is complete what this um, graph shows you is the presence of civilian militarized civilian and paramilitary police in all 19 countries from either from 1946 or from the date uh, at which the country became independent. And here we use the correlates of war uh, data sets, um, their list of uh, system membership. So when whatever date that they indicate the country became independent, that's the date that we include it. And you can see here that um, most countries have changes in their policing systems over time. There's very few countries that remain uh, constant with whatever police they had in 1946 or at independence, they have it today. Um, there's change in all but three of the countries here. And just to give you an example of one of these changes, you can see Tunisia here uh, at independence. This is a former, uh, you know, former French colony. At independence, they have this sort of French system of policing, which is a bifurcated model where there's one militarized gendarmerie type force. It's called the National Guard in Tunisia, and then a civilian force. And the National Guard, the sort of um, par uh, more paramilitary style force, is largely responsible for policing in rural areas, although it sometimes does come into cities. And then the uh, unmilitarized, the civilian police force is supposed to do urban, um, largely urban policing. That gets muddied very quickly. Um, and you can see a shift here uh, that's happening in the mid uh, or the late 1970s, um, where Tunisia goes from having a paramilitary and a civilian force to a paramilitary and a militarized civilian force. There was a hijacking of a British Airways um, flight in 1974 and a hostage crisis at the Belgian embassy in the capital um, in 1976. And after these kind of high profile events, the Tunisian government created an anti-terrorism brigade um, within the civilian police force, which is uh, heavily militarized. And so it moves into this uh, category of having a militarized police force at that point. Um, and you can see that there's change over time in a lot of the other a lot of the other states. So some basic descriptive statistics. What do we find here? Um, paramilitary policing is very common um, across all country years in the data set. Uh, some 64% of countries have a paramilitary police force, and then a pretty equal split. About 40 have civilian police, and or about 44 and 43 have uh, militarized civilian police. And most of the countries have more than one police force, which is why these add up to more than um, <laughs> add up to more than 100. Um, there's, as I said, little, very little variation in paramilitary policing over time, but civilian police have become increasingly militarized. This was what I had suspected uh, from the sort of broader state security forces data. Set, but I think this data is much more targeted to get at that, uh, get at those changes. So in the early 1960s, some 20% of countries in the data set had militarized civilian police. 
And now uh, in 2020, that's more than 70%. And you can see that change, um, I think, pretty clearly on this, on this graph. So this shows, uh, going from um, mid-1940s up to 2020, uh, the share of regimes in the data set with each type of force. So the increase here is this solid black line, uh, which is militarized civilian police, which you can see goes from this kind of low down here um, in the uh, early and mid-1960s up to a high uh, at the end of, uh, by 2020. Paramilitary policing, which is the kind of dotted line, has remained relatively constant, um, and purely civilian police have, have declined over time uh, as well. So those are sort of broad trends. Um, what's driving these changes over time, and, and what have the consequences been? Um, I noted that uh, in my discussion of Tunisia, that there's some sort of, uh, that basically some states have come, have uh, gained independence and uh, inherit a model of colonial policing from uh, former colonial powers. And we see across the region, uh, actually, that former French colonies tend to begin with paramilitary police at independence and they don't get rid of them, right? So they have sort of always have these like more militarized form of policing. But all types of states, former French colonies and not, have increasingly militarized their forces over time. And we identify a couple drivers of this trend. Um, one, uh, beginning in the 1960s is real concern about, um, real concern about the threat of a coup which is driving uh, leaders in the region to try and build up the Ministry of Interior as a potential counterweight to the regular military. And so they start trying to, uh, they move some police forces from the defense ministry to interior ministries, they provide more weaponry, um, and it's kind of this dual purpose of internal repression and uh, serving as a counterweight to the military. There's also increased um, funding over time that's available for uh, investments in police forces without taking away from the, from the military budget due to the spread of oil rents beginning in the 1970s. And then there's a lot of foreign aid, uh, US aid in particular, counterterrorism aid, and just general security assistance beginning in the 80s, but really accelerating um, after 9-11. There is this period, um, you can see in this graph that uh, you don't really see that uh, there's reforms happening post Arab Spring in the region, um, partly because I think the, the protests in the Arab Spring didn't end up resulting in really lasting change in most, most uh, countries. Uh, but the countries that underwent the most reform, uh, Tunisia and Egypt, they found really strong resistance to efforts to um, efforts to reform the police, both from police officers themselves, but then also from military forces that wanted to retain the Ministry of Interior as a strategic ally, um, or that just felt it would be too unpopular, actually, uh, to reform these police forces, which were a source of a lot of employment and income. So these reforms stalled, and public opinion data on the region suggests that people increasingly see a sort of trade-off between police reform and stability. And so they become, over time, less supportive of reform efforts. So how might police militarization affect political stability then? Um, I have a, we basically, I have a bunch of hypotheses here, <laughs> and uh, one would, I think this is the beginnings of a much larger project that would we'll be trying to go into these uh, uh, in particular, but the basic upshot is that even though leaders are creating uh, militarized police forces to try and help them uh, address internal security threats, I think that this is likely not going to be very effective, right? Um, it may be true that they are better at counterinsurgency uh, than the regular military would be because they are more locally embedded and they have more um, information, like they're, it's easier for them to sort of talk to residents and get information and there might be some reasons why that would be the case. But their presence can also antagonize the regular military that doesn't want resources flowing to uh, police forces rather than, than the military. And it might result in more violent uh, repression that fully, further radicalizes regime opponents, right? So if you are responding to protests with a um, more militarized response, that might end up um, making people feel that the only option they have is a, a larger sort of armed uh, revolt. So I can see it sort of backfiring in that way. Um, what I did to try and uh, <laughs> evaluate this in the Middle East and North Africa thus far as I took um, is to acknowledge that the obviously the, the creation of riot units, tactical units, these militarized police, militarized civilian police in particular is not random. And so I took sort of two approaches to try to understand its effects. Um, 
The first is to examine whether the creation of a new tactical unit, so the shifting of a civilian police force into a militarized civilian police force, whether um, that change preceded any changes in the level of uh, internal conflict that a country uh, is facing. This graph here shows you um, the the extent of major episodes of political violence, um, which includes a lot of sort of, it's all civil violence, uh, it, it's, all, it's all domestic, but includes ethnic violence, coups, civil wars, uh, things of this nature, anything that reaches over 500 uh, fatalities. Um, this data is from the Center for Stomach Peace. And what I did was I, on this red line is the date of creation of a militarized police force. So where you shift from civilian to military, a uh, militarized. And I looked at five years before and five years after to see if there was any change uh, that was happening. And as you can see here, there's no decline in the extent of um, militarized or the extent of uh, episodes of political violence that a regime sees after creating a new force. You also don't see actually that there's um, these forces are being created in moments of major disturbance or uprising. And in fact, um, the, the way that this variable is coded, the major episodes of political violence um, uh, data, this, uh, this specific indicator um, is an is a index that goes from zero to 10. Um, across all country years in, in the data set, the average is um, 0 0.9, uh, 0.98, so almost one. So actually, uh, you, <laughs> countries that are creating militarized civilian police are actually have a below average level of um, internal conflict um, compared to others, uh, the states that are not. So there doesn't seem to be a change here in like the decline in internal conflict. I also see that in this uh, region, at least, militarization of police forces has not prevented regime failure. So here I'm using data from um, Gutis, Wright and France's data on autocratic breakdowns. Um, where the government is ousted by a coup, an uprising, a civil war, or a competitive election removes the government. And what I've done is shown you this by uh, the presence of a militarized civilian police force or the presence of a paramilitary force. And uh, you can see that if you have a, uh, if you do not have a militarized civilian police force, the rate of which um, regimes fail is 4.4%. This is lower if you do have a militarized police force, 2.2, but this is not statistically significant at conventional levels. Um, so this difference is, is just, it could be due to chance, right? This is not actually a, a real difference. Uh, what, and what you see with paramilitary police is actually the opposite relationship than what you would expect uh, or what these, uh, the autocrats that are adopting militarized policing want to be happening. Uh, so if you have a paramilitary police force, you are more likely to fail and that uh, the statistical significance here is, is um, kind of borderline also, but it is um, uh, below 0.05. So you have a situation where if uh, it's clear from this data that militarization is not associated with lower rates of regime failure and if anything the presence of paramilitary police um, is associated with higher rates of regime failure. So it's not working out in the way in which the leaders that adopt militarized policing would like. Okay, so some conclusions. Um, I think we can say on the basis of the data that we have that police forces across the globe become more militarized over time, adopting the weaponry and tactics of military forces. Within the Middle East, policing has always been militarized to some extent. Almost all, uh, many countries have had paramilitary style police this entire time. Uh, but the use of tactical units, riot squads, um, anti-terrorism brigades, um, these kind of specialized units within civilian police um, has increased over time. And this has been largely driven by internal security threats and the availability of, of funds. Um, but the adoption of militarized policing in the Middle East and North Africa has not been associated with a reduction in rates of crime, or uh, rates of regime failure or internal conflict. So where does that leave us? There's a lot of open questions um, that uh, I'm hoping to pursue in future research um, and I think others could pursue as well. Um, one, uh, the first is just about um, the relationship between militarization and police violence that we've documented in the United States. Um, I think there would be a very productive direction to go would be for uh, us to examine whether or not that holds in other contexts. One bigger question that I don't think I have a good answer to yet is why some rulers militarize the police while others use the military for policing. That's particularly common in Latin America um, and there's some specific regional explanations, um, but I don't know that we've got a sort of strong idea more broadly about what would make you choose to use the military versus 
uh, militarize your police forces. And then finally, it's a question that I'm particularly interested in because of my other work is about coup prevention and about the military itself. I'm really interested in understanding how militarization affects the relationship between police and military forces. In what, under what conditions are they resentful of this or what conditions do they think this is actually very helpful for internal security forces to be able to handle internal security threats uh, and, and sort of take this out of the responsibility, responsibility of the military. So how does it change um, the relationship between these forces? Do uh, police always feel like a kind of junior brother, younger brother to the um, the military here? Do they feel like their status is increasing um, or does it, do they have, they end up in competition with the military? So a lot of open questions for future research and I'm super excited to hear uh, what your questions are as well. I will stop there for now. Thank you so much.